All right guys, welcome back. In this video, we are looking at example number three for column buckling. In this case, we have a column with one fixed end and one free end. In this case, our column is not rectangular like the last two examples. We're dealing with a W shape, which uh, basically stands for wide flange shape. And the name of this wide flange shape uh, is W360 by 44. You can look this up in the back of your Mechanics of Materials textbook and basically any textbook will have tables for this sort of thing and uh, from there we can figure out it just basically prints it has all this information it has all the moments of inertia in both directions the cross-sectional area uh, the depth the thickness uh, what else does it have uh, radiuses of gyration basically everything you need to know about these columns is in the table and so that's where these numbers come from for this wide flange shape all right so when we're looking at this um, this is a, uh, we have one fixed end and one free end. So if you remember from a couple of videos ago, we had these diagrams. Well, in the case where we have a fixed end and a free end, this is this guy, the effective length that we're going to be using in this expression for P critical is, uh, is twice the actual length of the column. Now we have to make sure that that's in both directions that this can possibly buckle in. So this column can buckle in the YZ plane, basically going out that way or coming this way. And it can also buckle in the XZ plane, so basically going kind of into the page that way or out of the page this way. No matter which way we look at it, uh, both of those are considered to be fixed and free. So we are going to use the effective length of 2L for both of our calculations. So let's maybe put this here. So we have LE is going to be equal to 2L. Uh, so the effective length that we're dealing with is uh, 6 meters. All right, so let's go and grab this expression up here. All right, and uh, let's start our calculations. We can calculate for buckling in the YZ plane first. So what we want to do is just drop this in here. Let's put in some subscripts so we have for calculating for the p-critical that would cause buckling in the yz plane. Let's give it that yz. And in that case, we're looking at the moment of inertia about the y-axis here. So we need to give it that subscript, right? Because if we're looking at buckling this way, basically if this is the top-down view. It's going to be going out that way. So we're looking for that moment of inertia about the y-axis. All right, so if we just plug in all those values for buckling in the YZ plane, we're going to find that it's 449 kilonewtons. And then we want to repeat this calculation for buckling in the XZ plane. So we'll just change our subscripts here. So we're looking for buckling for the P-critical in the XZ plane. Uh, so that means we're going to be looking at using the moment of inertia about the X-axis here. So we'll give it that subscript. So if we go and plug all of that in, we're going to find that our P-critical for buckling in the XZ plane is 6,689 kilonewtons. So the actual P-critical for buckling in this case is going to be 449 kilonewtons. Because obviously, if we go all the way up to 6,000 uh, to reach buckling in the XZ plane, we already will have buckled in the weaker plane, which is the YZ plane. Now, if we do want to maybe figure out what our allowable load is. If you're given a factor of safety, then all we have to do is we just say that our factor of safety is equal to our ultimate load over our allowable load. So in this case, all we have to do is switch those and we're getting our allowable um, is going to be equal to our ultimate, which is in this case our P critical, so 449 kilonewtons and we would just divide that by the factor of safety so divide by 2.5 and that's going to give us an allowable load of 179.6 kilonewtons so that is our um, that is that's our allowable load p allowable this was p crit and uh, there we go let's throw a box around that guy too oops not a straight line we want a box boom like that all right, so we found our actual peak critical. We found our P allowable. Um, the one other thing that we should do is we should just check that this column is not going to uh, not going to buckle. Uh, sorry, not going to yield before it buckles. So all we have to do is pretty fast check there. So we just know that we have our um, our yield stress. There we go. So. Our yield stress is equal to 250 megapascals, but the stress is also equal to force over area, and this is the force that is going to cause us to get yielding. So 
we uh, that's what we're looking for here so we have p is going to be equal to 250 megapascals uh, which is so 250 times 10 to the 6 newtons per meter squared times our area again this area for this w360 by 44 wide flange shape comes from the tables in the back of your mechanics of materials textbook so that is uh, 5730 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared just that unit conversion right there uh, and that is going to give us 1,432 kilonewtons. All right, so that is the actual force that's going to uh, cause us to get yielding. Note that 1,432 is a lot bigger than 449, so we are going to be getting buckling before we get yielding. But if you're also curious just what the allowable, um, if, if for some reason, if you want to know what the allowable force is, um, for yielding, same thing, we would just divide this by our safety factor of 2.5 and uh, and that would give us a um, P allowable for yielding for 572.8, right? That's just that divided by 2.5. But clearly, uh, the allowable force to so we're safe from buckling is 179.6. So this one is going to govern and uh, we won't be able to apply anything more than that if we want to keep within our factor of safety of 2.5 and be safe from buckling.